Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, um, Chev LS Engine Oiling Issues. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I look after membership and technical development over at AERA. Today, we've got a real treat. Um, this is an issue, uh, any oiling issues on the LS engines. We take lots of calls on our tech line, and I know talking to Kale, they take lots of calls as well over at Melling. So, Lots of information to go through today. We're going to cover lots of topics. Another way to get technical information from us is uh, is our podcast. So Chuck Lynch, who's on today, he hosts along with Steve Fox, and uh, this is uh, they cover business related stuff. They cover up current events. They cover usually have a topic related to something like this particular time is engine assembly. So we encourage you to have a listen to the podcast and uh, and subscribe to that and uh, and. Uh, some great information there as well. Another new program for us that's over on YouTube is our tech video series. So episode one is there now. And uh, if you are over on YouTube, just go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And that way you'll get all of our YouTube information. So on there, you'll find webinars, you'll find our tech video series. We put all of our, um, uh, as soon as we finish like the webinar today, it'll go over to the YouTube channel. So Again, just another way to check us out and get some more of that technical information. Let's get on with today's webinar. We've got Kale Rizinger, and from he's from Melling Engine Parts, as well as Chuck Lynch from AERA. So both these gentlemen are extensively, uh, uh, lots of experience with the engine-related stuff. Um, you probably talk to Chuck a fair bit when you phone the tech line over at AERA, as well as you probably talk to Kale a bunch when you're over at Melling. So what I'll do is I'll get off here, guys, and uh, I'll let you chat. How's it going today, guys? I'm good. Good. Very good. So Chuck and I are going to discuss LS oiling issues today. I'm Kale Reisner with Melling Engine Parts. Um, I'm currently work more in product than in the tech department anymore, but still do a lot of tech stuff at trade shows and as well as dealing with customers on the phone. So that's kind of where I'm at. Chuck, you want to introduce yourself for those who don't know you? Yeah, so uh, I work in the capacity of Director of Technical Services, so more on the tech side of AERA. Uh, you know, we all have to wear, wear a lot of different hats, and we're all on the tech line, uh, but, you know, I, I do go out, do custom training, and, and a lot more of those type of things. Anyway, a lot of years of experience, uh, a lot of years of working with Melling, uh, based on my past experience, but Anyway, yeah, looking forward to having some discussions here and sharing what we hear on the tech line and getting feedback from folks up there that are watching today. Absolutely. I'm going to start out with a little company history before we move into our actual presentation. Melling was founded back in 1946 by George Melling Sr. and his son, Ben. Um, they published their first catalog in 48. It had a total of 14 part numbers. In 1950, um, Melling started working with Willie's Overland. In uh, 52, the first performance catalog came out. The, the main performance part that we had in that was the, uh, the high volume pump for the flathead Ford. Um, actually a pump we still offer today and, and still sell a fair amount of every year, um, believe it or not. In 62, we started working with American Motors Corporation. Um, so today, Melling is a fourth generation family owned company. Mark and Matt, Harry Melling's two sons, um, are still on campus nearly every day that they're, you know, in town and, and around. We have future generations also starting to work in the building. So I don't foresee the company going anywhere. Um, family owned, as we know, is, is kind of an oddity anymore with all the uh, private equities scooping everything up so it's nice being able to talk to you know the, the people that own the place when we need to 75th year was 2021 we've been independent family-owned business the entire time this is a picture of the melling campus um 275,000 square feet of manufacturing space so we've got manufacturing and the warehouse here in this picture our screw machine facilities all the way to the right down there and then the building across the street is a, a basically a fully automated production and assembly area that, that holds it is a GM program that we do, an OEGM program that we do. Melling supplies all three aspects of the automotive oil pump market. We do original equipment, um, we do stock replacement, and then we also do performance. Um, we are the largest aftermarket oil pump supplier, um, registered to IETF 
16,949 and ISO 14,001. Um, we're supplying the original equipment, stock replacement and performance markets. So our customer spectrum, um, we have a unique opportunity to provide lubrication solutions. Um, OE customers, they require innovative and cost-effective solutions for new engine programs. Aftermarket customers provide us the freedom to allow for changes to the OE design. And then the, our performance customers continually push the boundaries of the OEM statement requirements. So we, we are a lot more than just oil pumps. Um, we offer pickup tubes. We have a screen plant here in Michigan where we build pickup tubes. Um, we've got pump kits. Our screw machine facility does a lot of our intermediate shaft work. Um, also do some of our pump components that are, that you know, you can run on the, the screw machines. Um, we have a, a very extensive line of timing and timing components, camshafts and lifters, um, valve train components. Expansion plugs, we actually produce expansion plugs now. Um, that's, a, that's a new addition to our manufacturing capabilities. We have a cylinder sleeve plant out in Iowa that we own, and then uh, water pumps. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, Melling has been an OE water pump producer for years and years and years. Um, we kicked off an aftermarket line, I don't know, three or four years ago. It's been really good for us. Um, and then there's valve springs in there. We, in the last three or four years, bought a valve spring company over in the UK. So that's been a new addition that's, that's been really good as well. And with that, we'll jump start jumping into some of the, um, the LS oiling stuff. So when we're talking about selecting a pump for a GM LS engine, one of the major um, conversations that we always have is what pump do I need? Um, GM produced two standard volume oil pumps. Um, there's the M295 volume of pump and the M365, M355 volume of pump. Um, there's a 33% difference in displacement between those two pumps. The 295 is a lower displacement pump. So when we're looking at putting a pump on an engine, it's, it's critical that we know what we're starting with. This chart's available on our website as well as in our catalog. Um, as you can see, it gives the displacement, um, the year that the engine, the coverage year of the engine, the RPO code, the eighth digit of the VIN, um, there's the, the GM number for the oil pump there, which uh, probably won't help you much in selection, but it also, for those RPO codes and everything, gives you the block material. If it has AFM and or VVT, and then we've got more of a breakdown of the application notes over to the right. Handy chart. Um, if worse comes to worse and you can't figure it out from the other screen and you have a pump on the engine that you have, there's a 12 millimeter cast hole um, in the higher displacement pump. So the M365, M355 has the hole cast into the pump over there. So that's another way to identify what you have on the engine that you're working on. Um, when we're talking about pump selection, as far as a high or a standard volume pump, um, this is kind of an example of what, you know, the, some of the things that you need to think about. So the Cadillac CTSV with the LSA engine, the 6.2, um, uses the M365 stock pump, so it's the higher volume pump. The engine has, you know, piston oilers, um, which require quite a bit of oil. You know, it's just a an open hole down there, or eight open holes, just just blowing oil. Um, so if the if the engine's factory original has high miles and has reduced idle pressure, um, you'd want to go up to like a, you know, to the high volume pump, the like the M365 HV. We need to put more oil into those same clearances to, to bring that idle pressure up. Um, if you wanted to go to a performance version, you would go to either the, you know, the 10355 standard volume or the 10355 high volume. Um, those pumps have a hard coat anodized body, so they a little more wear resistant. Um, just a little tougher pump for performance applications. So Melling's LS oil pump family consists of 10 pumps. Um, on the stock replacement side, we have the M295 and M295 HV. 
and then in the the higher displacement pumps we have the m365 m355 and then the m365 hv when we get into the performance pumps um, we had some requests from some builders that were doing like the copal camaro engines um, the priority main stuff that wanted a lower displacement pump so we did a 10294 pump for that which is a decreased volume pump We've got the 10295, which is a standard volume version of the M295 HV. Um, we've got a 10296, which is a performance version of the M295 HV. And then we have the 10355 performance version of the M355, M365, and a 10355 HV, which is a high volume. It's basically, it's the, it's the, High performance version of the M365 HV. This kind of goes through what I just was just talking about here. Um, the 10294 is a 15% decrease in volume. The 296 is 18% increase over the 295. And then we say this is a plus 33%. We're referencing that back to the 10295. This is actually the 10355 is actually a standard volume pump. Um, and then the 10355 HV is a high volume version of the 10355. And that's where things get kind of convoluted when we're talking about pumps and high volume and standard volume because there were two standard volume pumps for this engine family. So I kind of touched on this before too. The 10294 was designed for the priority main oiling engine blocks, aftermarket blocks. Um, we had some builders that were machining rotor sets and, and pump bodies down, basically creating this pump in their shop. And, and they came to us and asked if we'd just do it here. And, and we did. And it's, it's been a, a pretty good deal for us. It's been a decent seller. Um, the 10295, like I said, it's a standard volume, high pressure pump, um, comes with a high pressure spring in it. Also includes the Copo Camaro spring as well as a standard pressure spring, depending on what you want to do there for your bypass setting. The 296, 18% increase in flow, also comes with a high pressure spring in it. We'll also include the Copo Camaro spring. Uh, 10355, um, standard volume, high pressure, 70 pound spring in that. Um, we'll also include a, a 10 PSI higher bypass spring for that as well. Uh, 10355 HV, so that's going to be the high volume version of the 10355. High pressure spring will also include a second 10 psi higher spring and a third 20 psi higher spring. And all of our pumps are going to come with an O-ring pack for the pickup tube. So from there we'll jump into how oil pressure is created. When the OE is designing a pump, um, they look at the engine's requirement to have adequate hot idle pressure and they, they design a pump from there to meet that requirement. And with CAFE standards and everything the way that they are, they are shooting for a the minimum that they can get into that engine to make the pressure that they need to make. Um, that's why they went to variable displacement pumps, uh, vein pumps. There's less rotating resistance, so we're not using the horsepower, we're not using the fuel to turn that pump that's 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 the main reason that they did that so they're looking to put the bare minimum of oil into that engine to get the pressure that they need to keep that light off that they they possibly can and basically when we're talking about pressure um a pump doesn't make pressure a pump sends a flow of oil into a set of clearances the resistance to that flow of oil is what's creating the pressure i think chuck said it best the other day when we were talking about uh, pressure and flow you know a, a lake there's no pressure in a lake there's no pressure in a body of water another way to look at it is your garden hose if you turn your garden hose on the water's just kind of running out the end as you take your thumb and, and put it over the end of the hose you know you're increasing that pressure as it's spraying so you're resisting you're putting you're adding resistance to that flow of water as that happens it, it's basically the same thing in an engine with an oil pump um, if we talk about the bypass circuit in the pump so our pumps the pressure relief valve bypasses oil back into the inlet side of the pump 
we refer to this as supercharging the inlet. So as we put that bypassed oil back into the rotor set, it helps to fill that rotor set. You're gonna get better pump performance that way. Um, lower cavitation, or I should say higher cavitation RPM. It just makes the pump work. You know, it's, it's a much more efficient way of, of pumping oil. You know, out in the market, sometimes we see guys that are modifying pumps. They'll take and they'll drill holes in the pump cover over where the bypass circuit is to try to try to dump the oil back into the sump. You're really, really hurting the pump that way. You're going to, the pump's going to cavitate at a lower RPM. Um, you're going to aerate the oil. The bypass circuit should, should really be left alone on a pump. So high volume versus standard volume. <clears throat> a high volume pump from way back in the flathead days, high volume pumps were developed to send more volume of oil into that same set of clearances. Back in the day, they were basically designed as almost a band-aid to worn engine components, worn bearings, worn clearances in the engine. Um, we could add more flow to the same set of clearances to get a higher pressure. And that's, that's still true today. That's still where a lot of these are used. But now we can also use that higher volume if we're adding things such as, you know, if we've got valve train oiling provisions in an engine, if we're, if we're adding piston oilers, um, power adders, uh, remote filters, coolers with a lot of line, anything like that, um, we're going to want to go to a higher volume pump to help keep that pressure up as we add, add to the demand on the oiling system. Um, when we're talking a high pressure pump, it has nothing to do with the volume. Um, high pressure simply refers to the point at which the pump by, starts bypassing oil. Um, so essentially the spring that's behind the bypass valve. Um, if we put a, a heavier spring in there, it's gonna make it, you know, it's gonna bypass at a higher pressure. Um, that's what we're referring to when we say high pressure. So high pressure has absolutely nothing to do with the the volume output of the pump. It's simply where the pump's going to bypass. And that's another that's another area that we seem to talk about quite a bit. There's a lot of confusion um, when we talk about high volume and high pressure. Um, so oil pump improvements, when we're talking about the LS set or LS pump, some of the stuff that we did to improve on the LS pump was in the housing, um, the rotor set, the cover, and um, you know, there were quite a few components that we worked on the design as well. We took the oil pump cover plate and changed it from stamped steel to a double disc ground cast iron that's coated. Um, that protects against dry start as well as the galling issues that GM had. It seals a lot better as well. Um, GM had some issues with the pressure relief valve sticking. A lot of that problem was in the valve bore. They also had some issues with the inlet that we improved on. We took quite a few lessons from the original OE design and improved on those in our LS pump. Um, I think two years ago, it's been now, GM came to us and we are actually supplying all of their service pumps now for the LS engine. So I think they finally came around and realized that um, we were doing a little bit better than they were. Okay, well, before we move on, I think there's an opportunity with <clears throat> some of those issues you know, if we would put a stronger pressure leg regulator spring, or if we had more of a high volume pump, for instance. So some, like if that pump, the pressure regulator is staying in open position and moving a lot there, you know, that's opportunity for wear deflection of that lid because the clearances don't really need it. So if I can't move the oil through the clearances, the pressure regulator is open more. Then it goes back to the suction side. Well, the more I compress that oil through the pump and I can't send it to the clearances, it can't flow and cool, you know, take away heat in the engine parts, but I'm superheating the oil by recompressing it in the pump. Now I send hotter oil out to the clearances. So just another thing that you know folks should watch. If you don't have the need for the volume, a high volume pump, don't do it. You know, it's uh, it's it's going the wrong way. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And we we get complaints of that, especially it seems like the circle track guys, the guys that we mainly get the high oil temperatures from. 
and when you're talking to them, you know, you ask them how, how you know what kind of oil pressure they've got, and they're over 100 psi. They've got a high volume pump on there, and they're like you said, they're just bypassing a ton of oil. We've also seen um, on some dyno testing where we've had an engine that that definitely didn't need a high volume pump, and we we put a, a clear pan on it. And it gets to the point of where that pump's trying to displace so much oil through the bypass circuit that it essentially blows all of the oil out of the gear set. So it almost has to pick up and reprime. It's it it's interesting to watch, but yeah, too much volume is definitely a bad thing. So talking about the advantage of the cast iron cover, um, number one's rigidity. It's it's much improved rigidity over the stamped steel. With it being coated, it has better lubricity. The aluminum covers, and we've seen it especially on the Ford Modular covers. Um, we've got a video that, that we had the Ford Modular pump and ours on our test stand, and it's amazing that the way, how much that cast, or the, I'm sorry, the stamp steel cover leaked. The pump's much, much, it, it much better sealing pump with a cast iron cover. We touched on the lubricity. Um, cast iron is a much, is much better lubricity than stamped steel and then again the protection against galling that's the two dissimilar metals um, calling on each other and it it definitely will cause and has caused catastrophic oil pump failure um, on the gm pumps um, when we did the cast iron cover we countersunk the holes so that we could use a um, a screw that is essentially flush with the cover um, this gives you more room at, at the timing cover for a high volume pump, or if you're gonna put, let's say a double row timing set on, with the hex head bolts they used on the OE cover, you had a lot of interference issues if you were gonna to try to do something like that. So we were talking about the cast iron and stamped steel covers. This pump in the picture is a GM pump. It's actually out of a, a one of our coworkers' vehicles. Um, this pump, the rotor set, you can see obviously galled with the cover um, it actually locked the pump up to the point of the engine not turning over anymore this particular vehicle i think was around 25,000 miles didn't have many miles on it was still under factory warranty um, but this this is exactly what we're talking about when we when we speak to galling between the stamp steel cover and the rotor set so um pressure increase we've got a couple slides we're going to show that are going to have some flow charts on them um, some strip charts they're gonna show the flow difference between the melling and the GM pump. We were able to create better flow with our internal tolerances of our pump, the better sealing of the cover, as well as the improved inlet design. As you can see, um, where are we? About 3000 RPMs. We were about five PSI better. And it went that way, you know, it went that way all the way through the RPM range with a GM pump versus ours. Um, this shows a used GM pump with around 30,000 miles versus the new GM pump versus the Melling M295. We did this just to show how the pump changed. I mean, we look at an oil pump and it's essentially a trash pump. Um, anything that's in the oil any garbage that's in the oil is going through the pump before it goes to the filter. So that gives an opportunity for a lot of internal pump wear, um, both on the rotor set as well as the rotor to the pump body. Here it's basically saying the, the, the efficiency was only gained by making those adjustments. The the math, okay, so the, the rotor set, the volume is exactly the same. You just improve some things within the pump, the lid, and so forth, and it improved the efficiency of the pump. Absolutely. So the the improvements on the cover, the better sealing cover. We don't have that that leak all the way around the cover. Um, a big change was the inlet design as well. Um, we really improved the inlet. The oil coming into the pump was a big improvement as well. And then the bypass circuit we also changed around a little bit. So. You know, the, the few small changes that we made to that pump really affected the, the displacement of that pump, I would say, pretty significantly. So another conversation we have a lot, we talk about cavitation. This is a strip chart of the M295 um, referencing cavitation. And cavitation is really a moving target. Every engine is going to have a different point of cavitation. 
it, it's dependent on a lot of things oil viscosity the displacement of the pump you know we're talking two different displacement pumps for the ls engine and the 295 and the 365 those two pumps are going to cavitate at a different a different spot because of the change in cav or change in displacement um clearances in the engine are going to affect it everything in the entire oiling system is going to affect cavitation um, so there is no answer of an LS oil pump is going to cavitate at 6,000 RPMs. You, you can't say that. It's, I mean, this pump we ran out to 8,000 RPMs. You kind of see it starting to flatten out around 7,000. But yeah, it was it's starting to flatten out, so it's probably going to nose over about eight grand. But as far as a a solid, this pump's going to cavitate at this RPM. There there is no no answer to that. There's too many variables. Yeah, especially if you start buying you know, maybe a custom oil pan and a custom pickup screen and you change the ability to even get the oil to the pump. A lot of unknowns, uh, you know, piston oilers, how well are they functioning? Are they worn? You know, you do have erosion. I know it's worse than diesel engines, but piston oilers do break down over time, but they don't control the flow as well. So I may have higher flow. Yeah, just too many variables to uh, to say, okay, this is the rule and it's always the rule <laughs> yeah absolutely yep so if we're talking about oil pressure concerns and this is regardless of the engine um, ls engine it doesn't matter what you're talking about and and this was kind of an afterthought i had when we we're putting this presentation together it's, it's something we talk about on the tech line a lot you've got to verify that you actually have a problem um, we need to determine if the concern is mechanical or electrical um, just because the gauge on the dash says you've got low oil pressure even if it's not an electrical gauge, if you've got a mechanical gauge, you know, on your hot rod, always get a second opinion. It's just like going to the doctor, go get a second opinion, grab, grab your handheld mechanical gauge and, and see if they match. I, I like to use a, a high quality um, mechanical gauge, but if I had some erratic reading on that, I would, I would want to even go back against that and, and double check it against something else. I, I want to have two things that match, I guess would make me feel a lot better about things um, when we're testing oil pressure we want to test our hot idle pressures um, really going to tell us the most about what's going on in that engine low hot idle pressure normally tells us that we've got something going on in that engine we've got a clearance that's open up we have a leak inside of that engine we're bleeding out volume we can't make the pressure um, the LS engines, I know that Kentmore offers one. I'm sure others out there do. They make an adapter that screws in place of the oil filter. Um, I really think that that's probably the best place to check your oil pressure. Um, that oil's coming out of the pump, running down that galley on the uh, driver's side of the block and going straight to that location. So you're getting a, a good indication, you know, right off the pump, you know, what's going on in that engine. Um, the VLOM filter on engines with AFM is going to sit up in the VLOM under the oil pressure sensor. It's a small screen filter. Um, and, and we kind of, I kind of put this here because when we're talking about checking oil pressure, if we pull that oil pressure sensor out and screw that gauge in place of the oil pressure sensor, if we have a plugged or restricted filter, that's going to affect the oil pressure reading that we're getting um, if you're having an oil pressure issue uh, and you verify it or it's different at the oil filter than it is up at the sender um, this filter is a good place to look um, it can be restricted or plugged the good and the bad about that is if we've got debris in that filter that's a pretty good indicator that our oil filter has been in bypass and started letting a bunch of trash around the filter and send it up through the engine. So it's kind of a good diagnostic tool too if, if we find garbage in that filter. Um, next we can move on to lifter bores. Um, seems like the LS engine lifter bores, especially in um, active fuel management engines, is something we need to talk about. Um, lifter bores are a very tight spec in all engines, but it seems like the LS, they seem to affect things a lot more in the LS, I guess. There's a, a thou of, of spec clearance there um, 
then we're looking at aluminum blocks you know an aluminum block tends to grow about twice the rate as a as a cast iron block so anywhere in that lifter bore is going to be you know further exaggerated in a an aluminum block over a cast block our lifter has a od spec of 842 to 842.7 so if we look back um, so 842 to around 843 we've got about a thou of clearance to play with in that lifter to lifter bore a thou thou and a half those clearances are critical <clears throat> and if we have wear in those lifter bores um, you know normally you're going to have fairly unless you had an axle start to walk out or something like that the wear is going to be fairly uniform so we're going to end up with you know 16 leaks not just one you know that's something to think about as well and then the lifter has a a very fine ground finish the picture here shows a lifter that we got back for return and down towards the uh, the wheel of the lifter you can see a lot of heavy wear on that lifter body and you know when we get something like this back to look at i look at that lifter body and what do you suppose the, the lifter bore on the block looks like i mean if it tore that lifter up that bad I have to assume the lifter that they took out before they put this one in probably looked the same, if not worse. What's that poor block been through? What's what's that bore measure? You know, it's something you've got. You know, if you're tearing an engine down and you find a lifter that's all scuffed up or tore up like this, you're, you're definitely going to run a bore gauge down that lifter bore and take a look at it. And if it's out of spec, you know, they can always, you know, find a machine shop that can overbore those bores and put a, uh, a sleeve in it to try to bring those back to, to size. You know, the oversized lifter, because of the complexity of them, it, it's just hard to find anymore. So, yeah, the, you know, it's probably an opportunity to make sure it's in the right place and ensure that you have the right uh, lifter to bore clearance. Yeah, and it's, you know, especially when we're looking at AFM engines, you, you know, we're feeding oil. This lifter is an active fuel management lifter, so it, it has the hole, the larger hole is the hole that we're feeding oil into to unlock that lifter when active fuel management is engaged. So if we have this lifter bore worn um, and we're leaking oil there and we're trying to apply oil, you know, a good flow of oil into that hole to release that that lifter, if we've got two or three thou of, of wear in that bore, you're never gonna get good flow of oil into that lifter to to release that that vel or the you know the the pins in that lifter. Um, this is a picture um this is i'm not going to say terribly common but it's not uncommon either either so as some ls lifters um you'll see axle walk the axle will actually start to walk out of the lifter itself um, and you can see where it started to wear away at that block right there um, seems to be a little more frequent in performance engines <coughs> because um, usually have you know higher cam lifts, um, a little more spring pressure. You know if you're getting some um, lifter loft off the cam lobe, and we're really beating on that axle and that wheel, um, you can loosen up that clearance between the axle and the lifter body, and and it'll start to walk out the side. And um, I've actually seen aluminum blocks that have got you know a, a little higher groove, a little deeper groove, groove worn on one side of that lifter bore. So if you've got a lifter where you see the axle walking out, you definitely are going to want to take a look at those lifter bores and, and see what you've got going on there. Um, this is a diagram of base engine oil flow on an LS. So the oil comes up through the pickup tube into the pump, runs down that oil galley on the driver's side of the block, dumps down into the filter, gets filtered, comes back out, heads up to the, the uh, lifter bores. Hits the lifter bores, grabs the uh, oil pressure sensor there as well, and then feeds down to the main bearings and hits the, the rod bearings as it goes through the crankshaft. Pretty basic. This is kind of a standard flow on most engines. This is basically how they operate, whether the, the pump's you know cat mounted or crank mounted or, or whatever. This is normally how OEM oil flow goes. With priority main oiling, um, a little different deal. <laughs> I don't have a diagram up of priority main oiling, but with a priority main oiling block, the oil is going to come out of the pump. It's going to get filtered and it's going to feed the crankshaft first. We're going to hit the, the mains and the rods first, and then we're going to go up and hit the valve train. And the reason that we do this, um, the OEM is concerned about valve train noise. 
Um, if you go hop in your new pickup truck and you fire it up, you don't want to hear the lifters rattling for, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever it is, until they get oil up to them. If I've got a high performance or race application, I'm more worried about that rotating assembly getting oil. If I've got a little bit of lifter tap for a few seconds, so be it. It's not that big of a deal. Chances are I've got headers on, I'm not going to hear it anyway. So that's that's kind of the deal with that. That's that's why they do that's why the, the OE does the oiling the way that they do it, for one of the reasons. This is going to be our oil flow with AFM. Um, so we're going to come out of the pump or sump to the pump. Um, we're going to shoot down, filter our oil. And we're going to take the same path down the side of the block, left side of the block. We're going to shoot up to up to that oil pressure sensor. But from there, we're going to feed the v loam and we're also going to feed the lifter bores. We're going to kind of tee off there and feed the lifter bores and the v loam. Um, from there, we're going to hit the rods and the mains. So that, that's kind of our oil flow on an AFM engine. This diagram just kind of goes back to what we talked about with that lifter picture. When we go into active fuel management, the solenoid moves and we supply a flow of oil into that lifter bore to unlock that lifter. All right, so kind of moving on into cylinder deactivation or active fuel management. <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through every, every step of this, but this is the enable criteria for active fuel management or essentially all of the stars that have to align for the PCM to say, I'm ready, go ahead and, and knock those four cylinders off. Let's go into active fuel management. So there's, you know, there's there's 15 pieces of criteria that have to be met there. You know, I, I've had a few of these trucks. Um, I've driven quite a few of these trucks that have active fuel management. You don't have a noticeable difference in oil pressure when the engine's in four cylinder or when the engine's in eight cylinder mode. Um, that active fuel management system doesn't use that much oil if the lifter bores are good. If you've got good lifter bores, the engine's applying oil to that to that port and that lifter, it's not using that much more oil. Um, in what I've seen, VVT is a much bigger draw on the oiling system than active fuel management. With all that being said, um, a big question that we get a lot is, I've deleted my AFM, what pump do I use? Or I've deleted my AFM on my engine that took a 365 and I put an M295 pump on it and I have absolutely no oil pressure now. Um, the quick and easy answer that we go with is the pump with the same displacement as the factory pump. If you, if you remove that, active fuel management, stick with the, the factory displacement pump. Don't, don't downsize your pump. You cut the supply to the engine by 33%. Um, like we were talking about, AFM is an operation, a very small percentage of most drive cycles. Um, you know, if you get on the highway with one of these vehicles and you watch that V4 to V8 mode, it's definitely in V8 a lot more than V4 and driving around town, it's pretty much always in V8 mode. So it's, yeah, I, I would go back and we always recommend going back with the, the factory displacement pump. With that being said, most, if not, the majority of AFM blocks are aluminum as well. So you've still got that, that you know, big growth in the block. Um, the AFM bypass valve. So we've heard some reports of these sticking in the field. You know, if you get some garbage down in that valve, and it opens, you know, it, it can hang open for sure. It was added to the engines to regulate the oil pressure supplied to the VLO. So if we're going into active fuel management mode, a cold morning or something along that line, we got a little thicker oil um, and that pressure's to the point of where the pressure relief valve and the pump won't regulate it. This is kind of there as a fail safe or a backup to, to help regulate that pressure. In this picture, there's a little cover a stamped steel cover that goes over right down here that goes over that valve that covers there to direct the bypassed oil down into the sump of the pan. GM had some issues with um, oil consumption on these engines initially. Um, one of their theories was that that bypass, the way that that dumps oil around the, the perimeter of that bypass valve it was actually spraying oil up onto the bottom of the cylinder walls. As the piston came down, it was getting on the oil rings and sticking the oil rings. 
I know for a fact that they did have issues with sticking oil rings. Um, so their theory made sense. Um, whether it was actually this valve or something else causing it, I, I don't know that for sure. Um, but that, that's why they did this cover um, that was actually a, a service bolt from the GM put out to do that. It, it does make sense. Um, another call that we get sometimes when guys can't get oil pressure initially out of the gate on a new build um, is the galley plugs missing. So the LS engine has a like a steel cup plug at the front of that left hand oil galley and a what we call a barbell plug at the rear. The one on the front's underneath the timing cover, the one on the rear is underneath the, the rear main plate or rear main cover. The barbell plug has an O-ring on it and then the front end's just fluted. Um, this actually goes in, the fluted end keeps the oil, basically the oil's directed in between the front and the back of the plug, up through the, the oil galley up to the, the top of the block. Kale, while I got you on that topic, on that barbell, um, one question that's come in is, uh, is there any value in an aftermarket barbell that has two, that utilizes two O-rings? Yes, yes. Um, there are some performance applications out there of the barbell that do that. <coughs> We're actually working on one as well. Um, the theory is that unfiltered oil can leak around that front of that barbell um, up into the oil galley. So if it gets around the front of that, that barbell, it's basically sending unfiltered oil into the engine. The fluted end of that's a fairly tight fit into the engine. Um, I'm not sure how much oil you would actually get around that. I think it'd be very little, if any. Um, but yeah, as a fail safe, that, that secondary O-ring on the front of that barbell is something some places are doing, and it's something that we're actually we're working on doing as well. Cool. Right on. Thanks. Um, pickup tube O-rings. I've heard a lot of stuff about dry pickup tube O-rings causing oil pressure issues. That's something I don't think I've ever actually seen myself. Um, we do hear a lot about it, so it's maybe just something I've never had the honor of seeing. The pickup tube issues that I think are most common or that we deal with most of the time is either a misinstallation or a misselection. Um, our pumps come with an instruction sheet that shows the different pickup tube designs. It also describes the color of the OEM O-ring and how it relates back to our aftermarket O-ring color. The misinstallation, we get a lot of guys that call and they will have attempted to put a pump in their, their truck or car without taking the pan off. So they'll loosen the pump up, they'll pry it down, the pickup tube down with a pry bar and then try to get it to reseat with a pry bar and put the, screw, the bolt back in. You know, putting a, putting a pickup tube into an LS pump with the engine upside down on an engine stand, you got to press pretty good and, and give it a pretty good twist to get it to seat. And that's with a pump not bent, not mispositioned. So um, that's one of the things that we, we run into a lot too is is guys trying to trying to cheat that a little bit and and change that pump without taking the pan off. It's always a good idea just to go ahead. And I know pulling the front axle out of a truck's not a lot of fun, but just you know, take the extra half an hour, pop that front axle out, drop the pan. You only have to do it once. And with that being said, you can take a look at the bottom of that that screen too, see how much debris is in that. Um, you know, there's a good chance that that's going to need to be changed too. Um, pump priming. Um, another call that we get quite a bit is my pump won't prime. And, and, you know, the first question is, how are you trying to prime it? Um, a lot of guys are trying to spin it over the starter. Um, if, you're, if you're spinning that engine over the starter, you're getting 200 max RPMs. Usually you're going to be down between 150 and 175 RPMs. And that's just not enough RPM to, to get oil up to that pump. You know, on these LS engines, we're talking, you know, a foot and a half or more of pickup tubes. So that oil's really got to travel a long way. The old small box, you know, we had a pump sitting essentially in the sump of the pan. A lot of times the pickup tube was level with the bottom of the pump. You know, we didn't have to move that oil hardly at all. The pump was sitting in it, so it wasn't that hard to prime that. So we need the, the additional engine RPM. We also need that crankcase pressure down in the pan to help push that oil up into the pickup tube, up to the pump. When we're priming an, an engine, we definitely don't want to take the pump apart. We don't want to pack it with anything. We don't want to put anything in the inlet to try to pack it, to try to make it prime. 
anything we put in that pump, we have to melt and get out of the way before we can pull oil into it. Um, if we're looking at something like a, a petroleum jelly, I mean, that melts at about 100 degrees. You know, if your shops, uh, we're in Michigan, it's it's cold out right now. If you're out in your garage and you did this engine, you put it in the truck and it's, you know, the, the block's 40 or 50 degrees and you fire this thing up. I mean, we've got we to put an additional, you know, 60 degrees into this thing to melt that petroleum jelly to pull oil up into it. Um, the only way we're going to create that, that heat is through friction at this point. Um, normally we're going to put heat into the engine with combustion, but uh, we're going to have a little bit of combustion heat, but the majority of it at that point, because there's no oil to, to lubricate anything is going to be through friction. And that's, you know, that's, that's where, um, we always recommend pre-priming the engine with something such as our <clears throat> priming tank here. Um, that's really the best way to do the LS engines. As you can't use like an old drill driven um, oil priming primer. Um, this hey, is an yeah. Yeah, so just some more questions just based on those last couple slides. Um, one is when you're talking about packing the pump, um, it probably should, should you should you be packing that pump with anything or uh, should you just be just basically priming it uh, with the engine oil that's in the system? No, what we recommend when we put the pump on is you dump some clean engine oil in it, just spin the rotor set just to make sure it's lubricated and then put it on the engine. Okay, yeah. all right. And then kind of going back to your pickup tube, um, when we're talking about the oil pump pickup tube, um, this particular question is asking, um, uh, let's just go here. Is the additional bracket that holds the pickup tube on the opposite side as the built-in provision a must or a worthwhile upgrade? It is not a must. It is definitely a worthwhile upgrade, yes. We offer a version of that. It adds a lot of stability to that other unsupported side of the pickup tube. Um, if, you, if you bolt the pickup tube onto that pump and don't have everything mounted, if you just got the two bolted together, and you put that bracket on, it's amazing how much rigidity you add to that connection, adding that, that bracket on the other side. So yes, I, I think it's it's a very good assurance. Um, it, it's very cheap insurance, I guess, as far as that goes. Super, yeah, thanks, Kale. <clears throat> so this slide talks about packing the pump. Um, this is a pump that we had gotten back from a customer. Um, it was obviously packed. I don't know if that's white grease or, or what they had going on there. Um, this little bit of whatever they put in here to pack this with, with that cover bolted down on the pump, actually locks the pump up. We can grab a pump drive and and spin it. But as far as, as putting your fingers in the rotor set and spinning it like you kind of normal pump, you, you can't move the rotor set. Um, if you look at the cover, you can see the wear around um, the ID of the cover, and you can also see the wear on the rotor set from the dry start that this created when they tried to to start this engine, and it ran without oil pressure. Um, so this is a this is a good example of of why we don't pack that pump. The other thing about this is um, whatever they're using here is going to be a magnet to dirt. Um, you're going to get dirt and debris stuck into that, um, as well as if that pump does finally get hot enough to pass that, the first thing that we're going to do is send that to the oil filter. So we're, there's a good chance we're going to plug that filter up and send the filter into bypass. The filter's hanging down low. It's going to get a little more air. So it's going to stay a little bit cooler. So it's going to take longer for that to melt inside of that filter. So that filter is going to stay in bypass longer and continue running unfiltered oil through the engine. Um, as that starts to break down and come out of the filter, we're going to send it into the lifters. Um, you know, when we're talking lifters, we're talking the clearances inside of a lifter. We're going out, you know, four and five decimal places. Um, that little bit of, of whatever that happens to be, if we send that into lifters, we're going to have valve train noise. Um, it's just it's just not a good idea, not a good idea at all. 
you know, I often share the the lifters like the Roach Motel, whatever checks in doesn't check out. Nope, it can't. <clears throat> While we're talking clean cleanliness, um, we'll get calls from time to time with valve bores, or, or, or I'm sorry, relief valves that are stuck. Um, so valve to valve bore clearance on our pumps is about 2,000 inch max. Um, a stuck closed valve, we can get real high pressures. We can blow filters off, um, which obviously would cause en engine damage. A stuck open. Um, we're gonna have issues priming low pressure, um, which is gonna result in engine damage. With that clearance being two tenths of a thou, if you've got a shaving in that oil, you know, machine shaving, any kind of shaving, a piece of debris that dropped in when you pop the cylinder heads off, whatever it happens to be, a, a piece of lint off a rag, you could get caught in that valve bore and hang that thing open or closed. Um, Cleanliness when we're doing anything inside of an engine is is very very important, and, and we need to make sure that we're we're being clean and, and cleaning things up as we go in and and recleaning as we go out. Yeah, just a statistic that uh, <clears throat> like the bearing guys use at, at in presentations when we have our conferences and whatnot. That as they you know put a number to bearing failures. In excess of 75% is abrasive material of some sort. So, you know, cleanliness, and you just cannot state how important that is. It is paramount, especially now, tighter clearances, uh, they just dictate more cleanliness. Absolutely. So another another thing we, we talk about from time to time is we'll have guys that take our pumps apart and <clears throat> to either shim them or do whatever they're going to do, inspect them. Um, they'll put them back together, put them on the engine, go to start the engine, the engine won't turn over. Some, not all, of our rotor sets, the rotor on the left here, you can see there's a chamfer around the OD of it. The rotor on the right, there is no chamfer. If we look at the pocket of the pump, which is the area that the rotor set sits into, there's a radius around the OD of that pocket. That radius needs to have that chamfer. If you put that square edge down into that radius of that pocket, it locks the pump up when you tighten the cover down. So I, I look at an oil pump, I, I think of oil pumps in conversations um, as if I go to a home center and buy myself a refrigerator. When I take that home, I take for granted it's gonna use or work. I don't need to take it apart, inspect it and do anything with it. These pumps, as they come down the assembly line, every one of them is tested for pressure and flow. Um, there is no need to take these apart. There is no value add or gain in taking these apart and doing anything with them. Um, they're designed to bolt on and operate. Um, but you know, if you choose to take it apart and inspect it, you want to make sure that you you reassemble it the right way so you don't have a lockup condition. The thrust plate has a a one-time I like to think of it as a one-time use seal, um, basically impregnated into the thrust plate. Um, this seal seals the both lifter galleys at the front of the engine, um, both the oil, oil galleys that run down the, the lifter bore. Um, so if there's a leak in this seal. Um, it's going to be a pretty major deal and, and you know hemorrhage a lot of a lot of oil volume and, and drop your pressure so anytime that you're in swapping a cam or anytime you take this plate off um, it's another deal where they're not a whole lot of money um, it's always best to to spend a couple bucks and, and put a new thrust plate on it while you're there so a biggie with the ls um, deal is pumping the pan dry um, we have a lot of conversations about pumping the pan dry um, Late model engines, as they've designed these, um, they've made a lot of improvements to the oiling system, um, both delivery and drain back. Um, you know, if we look at an LS engine, it's a dry valley. There's there's nowhere for the oil to set up in the lifter valley anymore. Um, the only place that we can really collect oil is in the cylinder heads. 
Um, if we look at that, you know, next time you've got a set of valve covers off, the only way we can get oil up to that cylinder head is through those very small holes, what, 60 thou to 100 thou of the, through the push rod. If you look at the oil drain back holes, you, you know, it, the oil is going to drain back a lot faster and get up. Um, so pumping the pan dry really, really isn't that, it really isn't a thing in my opinion, as long as you've got, I mean, I guess if you had a two quart pan on it or something, you know, you could worry about it. Um, that, and you know, normally this is reference to a high volume pump and, and we'll touch on this a little later with some, some more um, firm information, but that engine is essentially a fixed orifice. It's only going to take so much oil regardless of the displacement of the pump. We're only going to be able to put so much oil into that engine. Um, so yeah, this, this suck in the pan dry thing, it's, it's kind of a, oh, I'm not going to call it a myth, but it's, it's not always, usually if we hear, you know, if you ask the guy why he thinks he sucked his pan dry, he'll have a, let's say a number three main bearing that's burn up. Um, if you didn't have any oil in that pan, no oil to that pump, that entire crankshaft would be burned up. It wouldn't just be one bearing. So we really need to, to stand back and look at the, the whole system and think about how it works and, and go on from there. So Kale, uh, in saying that, uh, one of the questions that's come in, um, this gentleman's asking, he's got like an 06 uh, Z06 Corvette, 31,000 miles on it. He shifts a lot at 7,000 RPM constantly and starting to hear some valve train noise. Do you think the oiling system needs some attention? It could. I would want to take a look at the pressures at 7,000. Is, is the oil pressure nosing over at 6,500? Is he is he, is the pressure starting to go away? I think is what I would want to look at. Okay. All right. I don't Good know. Point. I don't know if he's got a system on that that he can graph it, you know, digitally. That would be the best way to do it. If not, I think I'd want to put a mechanical gauge on it and watch it up through that RPM range. All right. Good. Good answer for sure. Thank you. Yep. So we did some, we've done some dyno testing um, <laughs> with a flow gauge on an engine. And these are all numbers at 5,000 RPMs. And this references the, the um, it goes back to the engine will only take so much oil. And what we did is the low volume pump, the standard volume pump, and the high volume pump. <clears throat> and these are the gallon per minute numbers that we had on this particular engine. And this, like we talked about earlier, this is gonna be a moving target. Every engine is gonna take, is gonna have a different flow rate depending on the clearances in the engine, the components used. Um, but this kind of shows, you know, the increase of 15% to standard to 18% high. So when we went from the low volume pump to the, the standard volume pump, that's a 15% jump. There was an 8% gain in gallon per minute. So we were close half-ish, a little over half. But when we went from the standard volume up to the 18% increase of the high volume pump, we got a 2% a increase. This tells me that that 10295 or that standard volume pump was just about perfect for this engine we were about dead on because when we put that high volume pump on, we sent about 2% more into it. So we had 18% available and used 2%. So we were over, over oiling or, or running that extra 16% out through the bypass, which as Chuck said earlier, is gonna do nothing but really raise the, uh, the oil temperatures and it's not gonna do good things for the oiling system. We're going to get, uh, as, as we've talked about clearances, um, this is an engine build sheet for an engine that, that we did here in house, one of our mule engines. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I bring this up is, is um, you know, if you're going into an engine or rebuilding an engine or having someone do an engine for you, um, you should really get a build sheet with it. You should do a build sheet as you go. This has all of your clearances on every main cap, every rod cap, um, actual measurements as well as clearances, um, shows the parts that were used, um, 
this is really a good roadmap to what you what you have and, and what you're using. If you have an oil pressure issue that shows up, you know, six months down the road and you tear that engine apart, you can go through and remike everything, remeasure everything, go through it with a bore gauge. And if you can't physically see where that oil is going, you have this as a reference and can measure things out and, and figure out that you know you gained two thou clearance on main number two. I, you know, it's just it's a really good reference point if you're have if you have or are having an issue. <clears throat> so these are some dyno sheets um, off from the the low volume, the standard volume. And the high volume pump. These were all these were taken while we were doing the flow tests as well. The flow data is on these as well as our horsepower and our pressure numbers. Um, so this kind of references pump displacement relative to horsepower. Um, and this goes back to why you know the guys that were doing the Coco engines and, and the the high performance engines wanted that low uh, low volume pump. So these were all, I mean, the engine never came off the dyno. We swapped these all out. They were all done the same day within a few hours of each other. So the atmosphere, the, the, the environment was exactly the same for all these tests. The low volume pump, we had about, we had 361 horsepower and 65 pounds of pressure. That low volume pump comes with a standard pressure spring in it. So this is about where it needed to be or where it should have been. The standard volume pump, we lost a couple horsepower. Our pressure went up to 93 pounds. Um, we had the Copo Camaro spring in this, so our bypass was up around probably 85 pounds, 90 pounds. So that's that's about where that pump should have been. Um, the 10296, 355 horsepower, 92 pounds. This pump had a 70 pound spring in it, so we we were that proves that we were overrunning the bypass. Um, we ended up with, you know, an additional 22 pounds of pressure over the bypass setting, um, and this also shows that less volume equals horsepower. Um, that low volume pump was good for, you know, about six horsepower. It's not a ton, but you know, if, if you're running in those classes where six horsepower makes a difference. That's pretty cheap horsepower and, and six horsepower, six horsepower. So selecting the right pump, we're gonna kind of circle back to that a little bit. Um, you know, eliminating oiling issues comes down to selecting the right pump, pickup tube, oil pan, and windage tray. Um, if you're putting together an engine, you have standard bearing clearances through the whole thing. And, I, and I'm talking with micrometers and bore gauges, not plastic gauge. Um, a standard volume pump is what you should use and should be fine for what you're doing. Um, if we're building something that's going to have increased oil or need increased oil flow, if we've got axle oiling lifters, if we've got um, piston jets, if we've got um, valve train oiling, coolers, remote filters, um, any of that stuff, if we open the bearing clearances up because we're we're going boosted and we we want more clearance, you know, for more oil because we've got the high cylinder pressures. We're going to want to go to a higher volume pump. Um, so that's that's kind of in a nutshell or a, a quick answer of how and when we want to and why we want to pick a pump. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of where we're at with that. And that's the same that, advice you would get from your oil pump or for your oil supplier as well. Again, they would say, look at your clearances. That'll help you to determine the oil you're going to use. So consideration yeah. of the pump and the oil should be in concert. Yeah, and I think King's got a chart out there with bearing clearances to viscosity levels. It's it's a pretty good reference. I think it's King that's got that out there. But that's that's a handy chart as well that, that speaks to what you what we said there, Chuck. One question yeah, think, for you guys. Um, yeah that's come in so uh you were mentioning about uh oil filters before um talking about is gallon a uh, gallons per minute displacement is it get affected with oil filter media i couldn't tell you that rob i, I we're not we don't do oil filters and i've never tested that way 
Okay. No, oh, fair enough. Um, another question, uh, talking about one of your pump part numbers. So using the 10295 pump on stock LS, non-AFM, how could you determine if that is overkill? 10295 stock LS, non-AFM, as long as it was a stock M295 engine, it's gonna be, it should be perfect, as long as your clearances are right. That that is the engine that that pump was designed for. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, yeah. If we don't have any more questions, that that's that's kind of the end of of what I had. I don't know if Chuck's done or. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was just to kind of tag along and interject uh, as the opportunity was fit. So. Yeah. No, I, we went a little over, and I apologize for that. But there was a lot of information to cover, and yeah. Oh, super guys, thank you. Um, and what we'll do is, uh, I know, like, it never fails with uh, doing webinars and having uh, gremlins and stuff. I mean, Chuck's sound is perfect now. I I know that cambering, um, uh, it was obviously very popular. I can tell from the questions that we had that that was a really popular uh, section of the of the webinar. So, I think what we'll do is we're going to talk to Chuck about maybe. Um, you know, doing something, uh, maybe one of our one of those tech videos that we talked about that we have on our YouTube channel, we can cover a little more of that uh, of that topic. And uh, um, you know, I can we'll try and twist Chuck's arm about doing something like that, and then we'll we'll let everybody know when we've got that on our YouTube channel because <laughs> it, Chuck, we could tell that was a really really popular uh, section of the webinar. So most a lot of the shops are interested in just what you had to say there. So we'll uh, we'll do that and move forward with that one. So. Thanks again, guys. Uh, really appreciate uh, your time. We know both of you are very, very busy. And uh, Kale, for sure, we, uh, we appreciate all the slides. And uh, thanks again, guys. Very, very well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. What I'll do it. yeah, um, I'll go back over to Amanda here for a minute, and we'll just wind things down for you. All right, again, thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day. Um, we really appreciate it. As Rob had mentioned earlier, on our YouTube channel, you can view um, those new little tech videos as well as all of our webinars. So just go out to YouTube and search AERA Engine Builders or Engine Builders Association, and we should pop up there. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and you'll be notified whenever I upload something new. Lastly, when you leave today, you will have a survey that pops up. Take a moment, fill that out. Um, there's a spot in there to ask any follow-up questions you may have. There's also you know, use that as an opportunity to let us know what else you'd like to see in these webinars. We always love to get your guys' ideas on what kind of content you would love to see. And then lastly, you'll see our contact info is there. You can reach anyone at the AERA team by dialing 815-526-7600. And then you'll see my email, Rob's, as well as Chuck's are all listed there. Any of us are happy to help you. Um, if you, if we don't know the answer, we will find someone who will. So. Thank you very much again. We appreciate everyone and we hope you have a great rest of your day.